So I'm Karen Hollis and uh, director of the cultural studies program I'm in the English department and the global interdisciplinary studies program. And like I said earlier, before we get started with our presentation, we're just going to do a brief um, land acknowledgement, recognizing that this land at least where we are was originally and still really uh, uh, the Lenny Lenape heritage. And so let me see where I put this. Um, screen. So everybody can still see me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So um, you this nice picture I have and of the Lenny Lenape. Okay, let's see. There it is. All right. And here we go. So every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape people. We pay respects to their elders, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. All right, so there we are. And okay, so the way I've kind of organized this today is um, first, I think, uh, just to give a context to uh, the experiences in the writing of all of the um, all of our um, speakers here today. I have, I found a, a short film that was made, I think in 2014, and it was shown in the New York Times. And I think it gives a pretty good um, overview of the whole history and uh, movement of the Black Panthers and puts it into a historical context. But uh, with that said, we will see what our uh, presenters think about that. Um, and so, we'll see this video and then we'll come back and uh, talk about it a little bit and um, eventually everybody will if you would like uh, get a chance to ask questions um, so hopefully here we go um, The stories in the news today remind me of the sentiments of almost 50 years ago, when many young black people felt that policing for them was unfair. During that time period, being black in America meant that you didn't walk down the street with the same sense of safety and the same sense of privilege as a white person. There was absolutely no difference in the way the police treated us in, in Mississippi than they did in California. 
They may not have called you nigger every day, but they treated you the same way they did in Mississippi. The police jump on you, beat you up, put the gun at your head. This is what we were going through on a daily basis. I'm tired of it. I'll stay here as long as I have to. Now, as then, the need for change is real. Nearly every black man I know has a story about an encounter with the police. I myself have been stopped, searched, and had a gun put to my head for no rational reason. There, there, there. One response to police brutality in 1966 was the founding of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. We use the uh, Black Panther as our symbol because of the nature of a panther. The panther doesn't strike anyone, but uh, when he's assailed upon, that he'll back up first. But if the aggressor continues, then he'll strike out. When I first met Huey and Bobby, they were uh, in the process of forming an organization for uh, primarily self-defense. We didn't plan to have a nationwide organization, anything like that. We were organizing, dealing with the problem in Oakland. In 1966, California law allowed civilians to carry loaded weapons as long as they were not concealed, as do many states today. And the newly formed Black Panther Party took advantage of the law. The uh, California Penal Code section 1220 through 12027 and also the Second Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the citizen a right to bear arms on public property. Huey said we're going to carry our guns and we're going to follow the police and if they stop someone, we're going to stop, we're going to maintain a legal distance and we're going to observe these so-called law officers in the performance of their duty. Are you coming around the corner uh, to stay facing where you are? We would stop. We would get out of the car. We would walk up to the scene. Those who had rifles would carry them in the open. They were clearly visible. We would stand at a, um, a distance where the police couldn't say they were interfering with their arrest or their detention of the individual and uh, make sure that uh, there was no brutality. The police were confronted by citizens who were not just voicing their opinions, but were armed. They would uh, take the weapon and pass it across like this, and it would sweep right over the officer. No one would do anything until a policeman ejected around in the chamber, then we would all eject rounds in the chamber. And all up and down the street, you could hear this clack, 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 clack. And then when the traffic stop or the incident's over, they bring the weapon down across by you like this and get back in their car and drive off. It was very, pretty intimidating. The Black Panther Party spread quickly partly because young African Americans across the country had similar experiences with the police. We would get calls from Atlanta, Nashville, Raleigh, North Carolina, from Washington, D.C., Bridgeport, Connecticut. Every city, small or large, you can think of wanted a chapter of the Black Panther Party. There's no question that the Panthers were provocative, but there's also no question that law enforcement exaggerated the threat they posed and overreacted. Do you feel the nation is in trouble? I think very definitely it is. Well, what is the answer? The answer is vigorous law enforcement. That's the only answer? That's the only answer. How about justice? You hear a lot about justice with law enforcement. Justice is merely incidental to law and order. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover today asserted that the Black Panthers represent the greatest internal threat to the nation. Hoover said the Panthers have perpetrated numerous assaults on police and have engaged in violent confrontations throughout the country. When Hoover identified the Black Panther Party as the number one threat to the uh, national security of the United States at a time when they're fighting in, in Vietnam, you know, of course that was crazy, but it was politically very effective. And it 
says to law enforcement at the local level, we can take the gloves off now. We don't have to respect the civil liberties and, and we can go after them with everything we've got. Police say there was sniper fire throughout the early morning hours, so they moved in cautiously police and, and then began Police and Black Panthers clash in Houston, New Orleans, and other cities. The Black Panther police shootout In shoot the out, dawn hours in Chicago today, police and Negroes fought a pitched battle. Obviously, we are nowhere near this today. In fact, we may be at a transformative moment. People of all ages and races are recognizing the problems with policing in black communities and are protesting. Now, there's a chance for real change. But police departments and political leaders must not overreact as they did 50 years ago. They need to listen. When I say no, you say violence. No. Violence. No. Violence. When I say no, you say violence. No. Violence. No. Violence. No justice. No peace. So, I guess, you know, given everything that's been going on for the last year, the last week, or today, it's pretty hard to think of this as um, a kind of an optimistic uh, time. But nevertheless, um, our speakers today are activists, and they have been all of their lives, and they have not given up uh, on the dream of of peace and love, like they used to say in the 60s, um, for everyone. And it's my great pleasure to bring them here uh, today to us to talk about their book, uh, uh, Black Power and uh, Afterlives. Can everybody see it? You know, a little bit. There we go. And um, the enduring significance of the Black Panther Party. So all four of our speaker panelists here today have um, written parts of this book. And um, Diane Fugino and Matif Hamachis are the editors and have written new chapters. So um, I will introduce them. And then we also have um, um, D.T. Kioni Sadiki, who is also a contributor to the anthology and finally, our guest of honor, Hank Jones, who actually has an entire chapter devoted to him and his life and his activism and his role in the Black Panthers in this book. This book can be bought from Haymarket Books. I don't think it'd be good to buy it from Amazon. <laughs> so just a little editorial. So um, about the editors here, let me... Tell you more about them. Okay, so um, I have some more work. I'm about to get there. So, uh, so Diane uh, Fugino is an activist scholar teaching and writing about Asian American radical struggles, black power struggles, and Afro-Asian solidarities. And she's professor of Asian American studies and former director of the Center for Black Studies Research at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She has long participated in prisoner education and US third world liberation solidarity struggles and is active with Ethnic Studies Now, Santa Barbara Coalition, and a founding uh, member of Cooperation Santa Barbara. 
She's written several books. I'll just mention a couple. Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama. Uh, Samurai Among the Panthers, Richard Aoki on race resistance and a paradoxical life. So um, maybe um, Dia uh, Diane, you can uh, wave so people will see you. Um, is that happening? I don't know, I guess we have four or five screens of people. So I think I'm so happy. We have probably 80 people here. Ooh, very good, thank you everyone. So, and we also, another uh, editor and contributing author to the book is Matef Hamachis. He's a social scientist teaching high school, also a former journalist and a longtime activist working in Pan-African and third world decolonization, solidarity, education, labor, and political prisoner liberation movements. He's active with the Ethnic Studies Now Santa Barbara Coalition, which recently won the passage of an ethnic studies course requirement for the high school graduation in the Santa Barbara School District. Welcome, Matef, and thank you for your work. Um, and another contributor is Deki Kioni Sadiki, a black feminist, educator for liberation, artist, human prisoner rights activist working on behalf of and with US held political prisoners and prisoners of war in the fight for their release. She co-hosts and produces Where We Live, a listener sponsored weekly public affairs show and editor and contributing essayist of Look For Me in the World from the Panther 21 to the 21st century uh, revolutions. She's also had essays published in uh, San Francisco Bayview, Huffington Post, uh, and the Journal of Research Group on Socialism and Democracy. I don't know, maybe you can give us a wave, Diki. Um, there you go. Okay. And then again, our, let me see here. Okay, I'm gonna read you a little bit about Hank real quickly and then we'll get to our speakers and their responses to this uh, film that we just saw. Um, so this is just a little bit, this is the first paragraph that Diane wrote about um, Hank Jones, the blank, Black Panther. Hank Jones's entire life has been shaped in the historic struggles of black people stretching from Mississippi to California. The brutality of racism in segregated Mississippi and the contributions of living in the alleged paradise of post-war California established the foundations of his worldview. But even in depression area Mississippi, Jones's memories are also filled with being loved and cared for by his family as well as a nurturing black community desiring to and forced to support one another for survival. The lessons he learned about mutual support and collectivity in his small rural town of New Albany later found resonance for him in the grassroots struggles to secure the freedoms that black people had long fought for, but that had been continuously denied or turned back. Like his youth animated by anti-black violence, he found himself propelled into action by the brutal murder of Emmett Till. That incident produced a burning rage in him that in the early 1960s compelled him to organize with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and then the Black Panther Party. So that kind of gives you a, a glimpse into what formed this Black Panther and probably common to many of them. So, um, so um, now we're thinking back to the to the film we just saw. Um, anybody want to chime in about what you thought of it, what it leaves out, what it should include, what it did include, just um, your impressions of it? Any of any of you four? Uh, you know the. <clears throat> The Black Panther Party, the, the uh, state uh, always focused their attention on the fact that the Black Panther Party was an armed self-defense organization. They were much more, we were much more than that. We uh, 
we uh, were formed out of uh, a reaction to the police violence and, and uh, the murders, uh, similar to what's occurring on a day, almost daily, weekly basis here in this country now. Uh, we uh, also recognized that we were considered a colonized people at that time. We're talking about the mid 60s. And, uh, and during that time, we actually had no uh, representation in government to speak of or any rights that uh, people had to consider. And so we kind of left our own devices and we were marginalized, uh, disregarded, uh, underserved. And so we, uh, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense uh, was created to address the need for defending ourselves, uh, providing for the needs of our people. And that's why the 10-point uh, platform and program was created for the Black Panther Party. Yes, thank you so much for those comments. And I actually have, hopefully, um, a, um, a, a copy here or a list of those, the, the 10 point program. And so this was written in 1967 in the Black Panther newspaper. What we want now, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our black community. We want full employment for our people. We want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. We want decent housing fit for shelter of human beings. We want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this decadent American society. We want education that teaches us our true history and our role in present day society. We want all black men to be exempt from military service. We want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. We want freedom for all black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in court by a jury of their peers or persons from their black communities as defined by the constitution of the United States. Finally, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. So someday, um, so uh, tell us a little bit about how these, um, the plan was formed and maybe a little bit about who wrote it and um, what effect it had, and who read it, did it get to the quote mainstream? <laughs> You know, the, uh, when it, the Black Panther Party went into the communities and uh, polled the people, and asked them what they needed and what they wanted, you know. And out of that uh, came this 10 point platform program to address those wants and needs. And um, then they started implementing the programs. And that was key. Because there had been a lot of uh, conversation about doing things to help our people, but very little impl implementation of these uh, ideas. And that's what drew me to the Black Panther Party. They went from theory to practice and uh, started doing things. Uh, I remember when I joined the Black Panther Party, and I joined late. I mean, in my, I was older than most Panthers. Panthers' average age were uh, six, uh, 17 to 23 years old. Uh, I was married, had uh, 
three kids when I joined the Black Panther Party. And I think I was, uh, was that 67? Uh, well, I guess I was 35, 27 years old when I did. So, uh, and I had a, a full-time job I had to attend to. So, but uh, I was compelled to do it because it, uh, it needs to be done. And we used to say, if not you, then who, and if not now, then when. And so uh, anyway, um, the 10-point uh, platform and program just made sense to me when I heard Bobby Seal, who came uh, from Oakland across the bay from where I was living in San Francisco and ran down the 10 point platform and program. It all made sense to me. And that's what uh, drew me to the party. And the fact that they were actually doing these things. First thing I did when I joined the party was put a sign in the window of my mother's apartment at that faced the street and it said, this home is protected by the Black Panther Party. Hmm. And uh, we did things like that. We uh, escorted the elderly uh, to go shopping. We, uh, you know, we had uh, food giveaways and clothing giveaways and, uh, and all kinds of things like that, you know. I, I have a list of some of the uh, survival programs, we call them. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if you have a copy of that, but uh, there were something like 60 survival programs that all uh, addressed the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we did. Gave food away on a regular basis, our basis and clothing, shoes. We uh, had a Panther School in Oakland that, uh, you know, where we went to learn our own history and, and uh, our place in this decadent American society. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, you know, this, this uh, when you know your own history, it uh, definitely bolsters your own self-esteem and your own self-image. And I was told as a kid, when I was in elementary school, and he talked about history, and I was always left out. They said I didn't have a history. And uh, that uh, creates that sense of inferiority. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um. Can I just, I raised my hand because I wanted to know if I could add something um, to um, what Brother Hank was saying, right? Yeah. What, when, you, when you started out, Karen, asking about what we thought about um, the, the clip that was shown. And of course it was, it was it's, it's short, so it can't give a, a, a giant history, right? But one of the things is that that leaves out and they can't, I, I kind of say who always helps me to look at things can be a jumping off point to as a teachable moment to spark some interest to talk about um, to present the history in the her story right. Um, I would, I'm, I'm not a fan of, a, of, of stuff that some stuff that has been done uh, around the Black Panther Party because of what it leaves out, right? So while that clip did tell the story, some of the story of the Black Panther Party in terms of what Brother Hank was saying with the survival programs, um, what it didn't show was, and I'm not, I wasn't a member of the Black Panther Party, but women were central to the Black Panther Party. Yeah, right? um, there are political prisoners that exist today, people who are in prison today because of their membership in the Black Panther Party. When the narrator says that the FBI overreacted, 
to the Black Panther Party, to the existence and the work of the Black Panther Party, I beg to differ with that. They responded in a pernicious, deliberate, methodical way to destroy and defeat the Black liberation, the Black liberation movement. And so I think that it wasn't just an overreaction. It was planned. It was diabolical, right? And it was on purpose. It led to the assassination, um, the um, the murder, the, um, the the imprisonment. They they poisoned the breakfast food programs to scare parents from letting their children go to eat breakfast. Um, they did a whole bunch of stuff. It wasn't just um, an overreaction. And I also think that you know, like, of course, again. There's a lot that's not being able to be said in the seven minute clip, but hopefully it sparks people's interest, right? The Black Panther Party is carrying on the legacy of a Black radical tradition of armed self-defense, of serving the people, of, do, of protecting and serving and defending your people and your community, not just with arms, but with distributing food, distributing clothes, whatever people, whatever people need. So I think that the Black Panther Party is one of the most important movements and organizations of the 20th century, right? Because what they did was inspire movements around the world. Of course, they were inspired by movements for independence around the world, but in turn, they inspired people both in this country to join the Black Panther Party and in this country to create organizations that were particular to their groups, their multiracial, their racial and ethnic identity, but also around the world, right? That's why this book, I love the title, Black Power, Black Power Afterlives and Enduring Legacy, because there are people that continue to be inspired by what the Black Panther Party did and accomplished in its short time, even with this defeat under COINTELPRO, that people, children are still eating breakfast in school. They are, they're called social programs that were co-opted, right? People can get food from, pan from food pantries. People can go to free and sliding scale health clinics. None of that existed. Mm -hmm. So today people call it, quote, welfare or social programs, but prior to 1967, those social programs did not exist. Those social programs existed because there was an organization that was created to address the material needs of poor and working class Black people. And I don't think that those things are said enough for like the legacy of the Black Panther Party. People focus on the... Um, the patriarchy, they focus on the men, or they focus on the armed self-defense, but they don't focus on the things that were really central to being educated, being critical thinkers, being of service to your community, and also being not just pan-Africanist, but global. Right, because the people in the party worked with people around the world, and they and people in the party. Some of them traveled around the world. Dr. Matulu Chikula traveled to China for for acupuncture. So people traveled, and so when I say that, I believe, and I'm 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 as a, I'm not a groupie, right? I wasn't a member of the Black Panther Party, but if we're gonna teach history, then we teach the fullness of it. And I think that sometimes what happens is that when people talk about the Black Panther Party, they often talk about the same things and the same people. You can watch a lot of videos and it's always the same people. I don't think I've ever seen Hank in a video about the Black Panther Party. And that's no shade against other people, but I just think that there are so many stories and so many histories and her stories and legacies that are excluded. So I wanna thank you all for putting this together. And I also wanna thank, of course, Diane and Matthew for putting this book together because it does carry an enduring legacy. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for your commentary. Uh, it was always so wonderful and moving to hear, you know, uh, firsthand accounts of these situations, but also someone who, although you weren't a member of the Black Panthers, you've been an activist in the community your whole life, and you can tell the stories that need to be heard uh, because you experienced them firsthand. Uh, I'm wondering if any of the other pan uh, panelists would like to 
say a few words about anything. Thank you so much, Decky. Thank you. Maybe. You know, I, I would just like to add something, you know, when uh, Jake Cree said that, uh, you know, the, the roles of women <clears throat> in the Black Panther Party is kind of uh, downplayed. And uh, I'm here to tell you <clears throat> that the women were the backbone of the Black Panther Party. And that uh, that wouldn't have really been a Black Panther Party if it were not for them. They, uh, we were too busy dodging bullets and on being on the, on the run and getting locked up <laughs> and uh, things like this. The women kept the party functioning and uh, and were even uh, in engagements when we were assaulted were in the engagements that uh, defending the Black Panther Party, put their lives on the line. Well, actually, actually everybody that joined the Black Panther Party put their lives on the line because we had been designated the greatest threat to the internal security of the country. Mm -hmm. That in effect puts a target on the back of every Black Panther. And you didn't go in there most of us didn't go in there thinking that we were going to survive that. But we were servants of the people. Mm -hmm. I, that was not everyone that joined the Black Panther Party joined for the same reason or came from the same place in life, you know, point in their lives. But uh, me, I came out of a... Uh, uh, you know, a organizing uh, background. And um, I had developed a uh, love and respect <clears throat> for working class people and, and poor people. And in the Black Panther Party, actually, I learned to, exp to uh, broaden that, to uh, respect all oppressed peoples globally. That's what I learned from joining the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, John, thank you, Decree, for, for doing that. We, we didn't, servants of the people don't usually toot their own horns, you see. So. Uh, I know. <laughs> Trust <laughs> me, I know. I live with someone who I'm yeah. always, I got to toot his horn because he don't, because he don't do it, right? Because, you know, people don't, you know, like you said, what you did, you was raising your family, you wanted a better world for your family. And that's what people who struggle do. They do it not just for themselves, but they do it for the people that who are not yet born and for all the people, right? And so that's what separates people who just, you know, like you said, everybody had their different reasons um, for joining the Black Panther Party, but there are people who did so out of great love for the people, out of love uh, for freedom, and it's it, that is what has that is why we say this is a protracted struggle because that is what has inspired um, people to lift up the banner of freedom and self determination and and justice from 1492 until now because their love for the people, their love for freedom and their disdain for oppression and injustice. And so people fight because they love, like Che Guevara says, you know, revolutionaries are guided by great love for the people. That's not how it's presented in the corporate media because they, you know, like, J. Edgar Hoover said in the 1960s, the Black Panther Party was uh, the greatest threat to the, you know, to the internal security of the United States and called them extremists and, and militants. And it's the same thing that Black folks who fight now are called, right? They call anybody who's associated with Black Lives Matter, Black extremists, right? Yeah. But the, the most extreme things 
that oppressed people live with on a daily basis is oppression and terror. That is extremist. Extremist is that 20 year old boy that was going wherever he was going in that car and they pulled him over and he ended up dead. That is extremist. Extremist is one person can own 10 buildings and come outside and have to step over homeless people. Extremists are our children who graduate from high school and are not able to fill out a job application or be able to write a college essay. So when they use those languages, it distorts the reality of freedom fighting and why people fight for freedom. And it distorts the injustices. We end up doing what Malcolm said, the media ends up having us um, loving our enemies and hating our friends because we believe people are extremists. We believe that there's something wrong with being radical. Well, Fannie Lou Hamer talked about radical is just pulling it up from the root. But people think it's something wrong with being radical. You can call me radical anytime you want because if it means being associated with people who want to get to the root of the causes of oppression, capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, colonialism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, you name it, because this country got all of it, right? But we got to get to the roots of those problems. They want to talk, you know, they talk about, quote, immigration. Well, we know who the real immigrants are. Right. But when they talk about the border crossings, nobody ever asks why are people leaving their country? They talk about children and parents coming over here and risking whatever, but they don't say, well, why are you leaving your country? So we have to we have to challenge the narratives that exist about not only the Black Panther Party, but all people who struggle wherever they struggle. Right. And we have to challenge the we have to counter the narratives about language. It ain't nothing wrong with being a radical. It ain't nothing wrong with standing up for justice and being a um a freedom fighter. Right. It ain't not it, you know, prisons, they make people feel like if they, they should be ashamed that their loved one is in prison. It's the shame of a nation that this is a nation that has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. They're the ones that ought to be ashamed. They're the ones that ought to be ashamed that they say that this is the most industrialized, richest nation in the world, but you have people who die from preventable, preventable diseases, people who are hungry, children who are hungry, people who don't have access to healthcare. So when the Black Panther Party had that point in, their, in, the, in, the, in its platform and program about we want education, yeah, that's the kind of education we want. We want the kind of education that speaks truth to power of the kind of society that we're living in. That as you opened up, Karen, we are living and standing on stolen land that was built on top of the blood and the bones and the history of culture and cultures of people who have lived here for thousands of years before they came, but that's not what they teach. So as a result, we don't know, a lot of us don't know those truths. So we believe whatever they tell us. And then we walk around miseducated, right? And judging other people and not knowing that we have a right to fight. We have a right to fight. We have a right to live and be safe and send our children to the store and believe that they're gonna come <clears throat> back. That is a human right. Sister Karen, I'd like to add, because I, I do believe Sister Dayqui and Brother Hank have said everything else I wanted to say, but I want to talk about the lasting legacy of the Panthers in two arenas, one in healthcare, two in the fight against fascism. I bring those two up specifically because today we see a global pandemic, and two, we see frightening rise of fascism globally. The Black Panther Party addressed both of those issues very clearly. They had free clinics in every city where they existed. You could get everything free. <clears throat> Healthcare was open to you. They had volunteer physicians, nurses, techs, any test you can think of, they could give it to you for free. There was no need to pay anywhere. And without the Black Panther Party, I'm quite sure we would have never ever heard of sickle cell anemia. They made an incredible 
directed attack on this disease. They also, along with um, the young lords, made an incredible dent into lead testing for our children because the schools and poor housing had a lot of lead in the paint. And the Panthers and the young lords led the charge on getting that removed. They did the testing and the help for those families who'd been affected. So far as fascism, it was a Black Panther Party who in 1967, in the summer, held a three-day uh, conference on fascism. And they created organizations that sprung up across the nation. Unfortunately, we don't know much about those organizations because they tended to get either subsumed into the Black Panther Party itself or became Black Panther Party chapters. But those organizations did great work and we need to read what they did. We need to find that information out. I'm hoping there's scholars out there that will do that work because I've never seen a book on that. I think we have some incredibly powerful books on the um, health programs that the Black Panther Party uh, created. In fact, I just saw an incredible video on their acupuncture programs that I'm so glad you mentioned Dr. Matulu Shakur who cured everything you can name using acupuncture from the classes he took in China and brought back with him. Um, but this fight against fascism, the name of the organization is, doesn't hit my mind right now, but that's because there hasn't been enough study on the work that they did against fascism that we need to be looking at and working with now. But those two areas I think were very important because we still have those same problems. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you for your comments. Um, and uh, I think maybe now we can uh, invite some questions from the audience. And I would just like to uh, ask everybody if possible to maybe uh, just tell us your name and uh, you know if you have an affiliation or uh, maybe where you're from or where you work, something like that, just very, very brief. Uh, I think you know we would enjoy knowing a little more about you. So does anyone have a question? Don't be shy. Come on. Sorry. You can also post questions in the chat. I'm not sure if if folks are able to unmute themselves. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to post it in the chat and I can read it out for everyone. Melanie. Yeah, I'm not too clear what they can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Oh, okay. Um, hi, I actually, um, I, I don't know how to undo my video, but um, my name is- I don't understand what they did to us in that regard, but anyway. I can try to fix oh, it. What's I'm, your name? I'm sorry, I'm back. Um, okay. I was, I, I, I teach high school um, and I was curious, are, when you talk about teaching about black history, um, are there organizations out there um, that have um, some kind of curriculum or some kind of links where a teacher, I used to teach world history um, more than American history, but at the same time, like when I try to do stuff like with a lot of imperialism, there's a lot of organizations out, um, out there, especially on the web. Is there a place or a link that you guys could put on the chat that we could copy that, that would have some of this information? Um, um, so that if we wanted to put it into our curriculum, it would be, let's see for like, I, I didn't really learn a lot about, cause I'm, I'm on 50. So I, when I went to school it was in the seventies. So we didn't really talk a lot about, you know, black history at all. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thanks. at this time, everyone should be able to turn their video on if they'd like. Of course. Yeah. Uh, the Zen Education Project has a lot of very good, a very good perspective, I think, on all kinds of different issues worldwide, historical, contemporary. I put that in the chat. Zen, Howard Zen Education Project. And then I'm putting in, thank you for your question, um, um, Michelle. Um, it's, you know, there's, there is stuff 
um, even when uh, we're here in New, I'm here in New York, right? And so uh, the first week of February, there was uh, Black Lives Matter week at school and they had, they had curriculums, they had lesson plans. So if you went to the Black Lives Matter week at schools, they, they, there's a web, that's a website you can check out and maybe they have some stuff. Um, the Abolitionist uh, Teaching Network does stuff. Uh, of course, Howard Zinn, like Karen said, and Rethinking Schools. Um, as an educator who is on her way out of the system, I haven't necessarily written lesson plans, but I've always incorporated films and books and discussions and even bringing people to speak to, um, to, to speak to students. I mean, one of the good things about this technology is everything is out of our fingertips. So you can, you can put anything in the chat and then you just have to go through the, the um, do, through the resources, of course, it, you know, it puts a lot of work on um, the person who wants their children, their students to learn because we're in a system that doesn't want them to know this. However much lip service they pay to educating kids, they don't want to do that, uh, right? Because the truth is when Carter G. Woodson created Negro History Week that then became Black History Month, if history were told if true history were told, we wouldn't need Black History Month, we wouldn't need Women's Month, we wouldn't need Asian Month, we wouldn't need Latino heritage, heritage, we wouldn't need any of that because the truth would be told. We would know the history, but because it's not, then the people who want their children to know have to do extra work. And it, I know that it's a lot because I've been an educator for a long time, but I would definitely start with those. You know, it's, um, if you want to know uh, if you're interested in the history of the liberation struggle, you could go to a place like freedomarchives.org. Freedomarchives.org. You could, uh, the Schoenberg Museum, if you're interested in the Black struggle. And uh, they have a, a website. I uh, don't know it offhand, but Schoenberg Museum in New York. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to travel, I would go to the uh, National uh, <clears throat> Museum of African American uh, History and Culture in DC. That's an interesting place. A lot of information there. I think everybody should go there. They got one section there on the Black Power Movement, you know, and uh, and the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, Freedom Archives is a good a good location uh, for if you're interested in the history of the liberation struggle uh, uh, in this country or around the world, for that matter. Thank you for those suggestions. We noted most of them in the chat. And there was also something that I wanted to let people know that uh, Matef put in the chat about Sister Decky, who is married to former Panther and current political prisoner, Seku Odinga. Yeah, mm -hmm. former. He's a former, thankfully. He came home after <laughs> serving 33 years in... Um, in prison. He came home in 2014. And while we celebrate the victory of his release, we are reminded that there are still members of the Black Panther Party that are in prison today, um, as well as from other movements. We have white anti-imperialist political prisoners, the uh, indigenous, right? Sundiata Akoli is our 84-year-old uh, political prisoner. He was uh, um, an engineer for NASA back when they sent the first person to the moon. Um, but he was with um, Asada and Zaid Shakur on that turnpike on May 2nd. 
and um, when Asada was shot, Sundiata was shot, Zaid, Zaid, um, Zaid was murdered. Um, Sundiata has been in prison since 1972. He's been denied parole several times. He was ordered released by a judge. The New Jersey um, Parole Board appealed. They took it to court. The, it was overturned. He was sent back to the parole board who, who denied him and said he had to come back in 15 years. That makes him, that will make him 95 years old when he go when he's allowed to go back to the parole board. Kamal Siddiqui is another person that's connected to Father Shakur. She um, when when the reward for her capture was in early 2000 a million dollars. The FBI went to him and said, we want you to help lure her so we could capture her. Of course, he refused. He, he was a comrade in the Black Panther Party with her and Black Liberation Army, but also he's the father of her, of her daughter. He's like, I can't do that. They said, well, if you refuse, we're going to make sure that you spend the rest of your life in prison. Well, they charged him with a 30-year-old crime that they had to drop charges for 30 years prior. They convicted him. And he's sentenced to two year, two life sentences plus 10 years. So he's in prison. And our political prisoners, like um, what Brother Hank was saying, people were young when they joined the Black Panther Party. Well, they're not young now. They're elders. They're grandfathers and great-grandfathers. And they have health issues. And for people who are a little bit older on here, it ain't e there's nothing easy about aging. Even when you're in good health, imagine aging in a nine by five cell, a six by nine cell, the piss poor, um, the, the medical neglect, the food or lack of food that you have access to. It's awful. So we continue, um, we continue to fight for our political prisoners. So I'm going to stop talking because I see that there's some sisters over here that have a question. All right, is that... Uh... Daryl and yes. Victoria? Yes. Hi. <laughs> um, my Hi. name is Victoria. I'm a junior here at Villanova. And I'm also a junior. We're roommates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we both um, took the time to formulate a question. And we were just wondering, what advice would you give this generation in the pursuit of social justice in the wake of police brutality? Um, we noticed that like number seven on like the list of bullet points that you showed us earlier um, asked for like the cease of like police brutality and just the murder of black people. And here we are um, a long time later, like still in the fight. So I guess just like what overall advice would you give us? Well, I, I would offer this, you know, it's uh, like uh, they could, was saying, I got involved because I had kids and I didn't want them to grow up in the world I grew up in, world of uh, segregation <clears throat> and uh, dehumanization, all of that. So um, get involved, find an organization that uh, uh, is addressing the issues that you're concerned about are should be concerned about but uh, there are problems in this world and they don't go away by sitting and looking at them you have to get up and do something about it and uh, this is uh you know uh you know it's a form of it's a, it's activism this is what makes change in the country. Activists are changers. They make change. And uh, it is not without consequence. There's a price for everything. Freedom is not free. So, and, it, and if you gain freedom, you still have to be vigilant and be able to fight to maintain it, to keep it, you see. So, it's a constant struggle. Uh, now, if you're satisfied with it, uh, the way things are, you, you're happy here, you, you got everything you need, and, you know, you don't uh, 
care about the rest of the world and what they what they might be up against, then okay, you know that's your choice. But uh, if you got a conscience, if you have a heart, if you have humanity, mm. then you can't ignore this. What's going on in this country? We are at a critical point in this in this country. This is a critical time in the history of this country. But it can turn either way. It can go straight, full on fascist, or we can stop it in its tracks and create a better world. You have that power. This is what activists do, uh, organizers should do, is to f help people discover the power that they already have. You see, that's what a good organizer does. Uh, you, you you don't really need me. You just you don't need anyone else. You start with yourself. You see, start with yourself. Build the world you want to see. You see, and uh, you have that power. The world that exists today did not exist when I was a kid. Somebody made some changes, right? We made some changes. We haven't finished the job though. Like that Kui was saying, we did our thing, but then there are those of us who are in the ground, uh, who are locked up and have been locked up for uh, of almost 50 years. The oldest, longest serving political prisoner, not the oldest, but the longest serving political prisoner was Romaine Fitzgerald, Chip Fitzgerald, who just passed away a couple of two or three weeks ago. Yeah. He died in captivity. 50 years. You see. And uh, that's the price for freedom. Mm -hmm. If you think you're free, I invite you to do some research on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not free. This is not a free country, right. not even close. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I think like when you said about starting with ourselves, right? Talk to other people who feel like, who, who, who believe another world is possible. If you believe another world is possible and that another way is possible, then find other people who believe that and start with, start with them. Don't worry about how many people don't believe work on how many people do believe, right? That there were millions of people, young people, black folks, in the, young black kids in this country. Thousands joined the Black Panther Party, not millions, at least not that I know of, right? So yeah. start with who you have, right? And, 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 and work from there, but become educated, read. Like you're uh, in a blessed position because you're in college. There are children who are not making it through high school. So where do we reach their minds? Let's be willing to talk to people, not necessarily that are in our circle, but are also outside of our circle. It, and then if you use what you have, if you're a poet, write a poem. If you sing, if you dance, whatever it is that you do, because we all have things we're good at, then we use our voice and our skills in that way to work towards liberation because the things, so the, the Black Panther Party, what so many things made it, I believe, one of the most important um, movements of the 20th century, right? But one of the things is they knew that not everybody knew how to read. So Emory Douglas drew pictures a picture they say is worth a thousand words, right? For people who couldn't read the concepts, they looked at the picture and say, oh, police are pigs because they just feast on and, and, and just destroy everything in their path, right? And so dream another world is possible, right? Like this whole conversation that people had with um, defund the police. There were people telling young people, don't say defund the police. Why not? Right? Why not? Why do we think where the police came from? Police are extension of slave catchers, the overseer. Indigenous people around the world didn't have police. 
Police exist because capitalism, imperialism, colonialism exists because it's about protecting the state. It ain't about protecting people. So then let's protect the people ourselves and let's demand that these politicians defund the police. The police gets billions of dollars in their budget. Take a billion of that and create some social programs for young people that have to do with educating them, job training, right? Reading, right? So years ago, abolition was considered a dirty word. Nobody believed that was an outrageous word. So today is defund the police. But people believed it was possible, right? And that's what they did. And that's what they fought for. So once you believe, they have us believing that freedom is not possible. They have us believing that we can't change the world because people say, oh, that's just the way it is. Oh, you can't fight city hall. Well, I come from a people that have been fighting ever since the Spaniards, the British, the Dutch, the French, wherever they set foot, people have been fighting. So if you believe that, then we know that we fight in the time that we have, because I know how blessed I am, right? That I was able to go to college. Um, I'm able to live a life that my ancestral grandmothers and grandfathers didn't. So I do what I do in my lifetime, in this time that I have, maybe some things I won't see in my lifetime, but that doesn't mean that I don't work to try to make it happen. And that's all of our tasks to see ourselves in each other and want for each other what we want for ourselves, right? They fuss about people not thinking about other people with during COVID. Why are all these people going out and not thinking about others? Well, that self-centeredness is a value that this country has perpetuated since its founding. And now you mad at people for doing what you've always told them to do, do you? So we got to deconstruct everything we've ever learned from this imperialist, colonial, white supremacist, capitalist nation. We got to deconstruct. And the Black Panther Party was pretty good at doing that because they have political education classes. So we become politicized. Why does one neighborhood look one way and another neighborhood look another way? That's what I, I get my students to look at the obvious things. Why do you think you know when you're in a black or brown neighborhood and when you're in a rich white neighborhood? It ain't cause people are dirtier. It's what services do people believe that some people deserve compared to others? So we got to break it down to people. Let's not talk to them. It's college is good and vocabulary is very important. I'm college educated, but I didn't go to college to be a part of the system. I went to college because I needed to get, I needed to learn the things I needed to learn. And then as a result, I gained access to people. I learned from, I sat at the feet of radicals and revolutionaries, right? And so I took what I learned to use it to serve the people in the ways that I know how to serve the people, right? So let's talk to people to break it down, right? Um, and you could get my email and we could talk. Because I'm always down with that, right? We always have to connect younger people with older people, older people with younger people. When we see ourselves in each other, that's when we win because that's when they start to lose. And trust me, this empire knows that. They know when black, white, Asian, indigenous, rich, poor, they know when people unite, they are afraid of that. That's why they work so hard to make us feel superior to each other. Because as long as we fighting each other, we ain't fighting them. So let's beat them at their own game. And that's why fascism is on the rise now. Yep. It's because the system is threatened now with people like yourself, young people out there in the streets yep. on a global level. A change is possible, that's true. but you have to get out there and be a part of it. Yeah, well, thank you for all those words of wisdom. Um, we have one more question um, from, or two, uh, one from Francis Murphy. I'm just going to talk a little bit about fundraising. It's so important for any group. 
Can you hear me? I do now, Francis. Oh, I'm sorry. I was wondering if you could talk about fundraising, which is so important for any movement. Mm. Now, how did you raise funds? How did no, that work? At the party, we had a we had a, 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 a newspaper, a communal intercommunal newspaper that everybody had to sell every day. <laughs> you got an allotment of uh, papers, you had to sell those. And uh, it was uh, part of the daily routine, along with political education, the feeding kids, hungry kids and stuff, all, all of this stuff. You work from sun up to sundown, you know, the Black Panther Party. So, uh, but we had an organ that generated funds. And once people saw you doing this kind of thing, and once you start serving the people, then they in kind will try to help you. And we had uh, support, broad support from all over the country, all over the world. We, as Dequi pointed out, we had we had uh, Panther uh, uh, chapters in New Zealand and Australia, uh, Palestine. Yeah, all over the place, you see. It wasn't a, just a local thing. And we didn't start out to be uh, a global organization. Uh, vanguard of a revolution. We didn't start out that way. But when the need arose and no one else was doing this, the Black Panther Party stepped up. And, and I would like to add, right, it's like one of the things as, as the organization I was a part of, the Malcolm X Commemoration Committee, we did a dinner every year. Um, and we so far we've had about 25 years to, rate, to say thank you to the families of our political prisoners and to raise funds for um, our political prisoners commissary, right? So people would pay, it would be a dinner right? So people would pay, right? Sometimes we would table at festivals and, 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 and street festivals and concerts, and we have a table and we put a jar out there, right? We Because when Frank says freedom ain't free, it's not. And we don't have unlimited funds like the capitalist power structure. So we depend on the generosity of people and the commitment of people. And sometimes it's at an event asking people, right? Deliberately saying, we need money to do this. Can you help us? Would you help us to assist us mutual aid to do, to do this? Um, there's different things. Uh, one of the things we did for Sekou when he was inside, we did, I wish I had the CD in front of me, but we did a CD project that was a fundraising tool that it was a compilation of poetry and song. Um, and it was called Freedom Ain't Free. And it was a tribute to the Black and New African freedom struggle and political prisoners. So the people can raise money and we not we may not be able to raise millions but then i don't know some people go on gofundme and they raise money because like you said it costs money to do everything that we want to that we want that we want to do but we got to believe that if we go to the people we may not get all of what we need but we can get some and then we do different things people have bake sales there's all kinds of things but just remember, when you start going to foundations, that's why they call it the nonprofit industrial complex. Because when the when corporations start giving you money, then they start determining what you can say and what you can't say. Yeah. Right. So we always want to be careful with that. Is that yeah, we take donations, right? And we're raising the money, but you can't control what it is that we say. Does that answer your question, Francis? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, everyone, I guess we, have, a, oh. we do have. I, we have I, one more. As long as people want to say, we could stay for a long time, and uh, people want to. But I, I think maybe, maybe I should give people, you know, some of the students or whatever that may have to eat dinner or whatever if you want to leave you can but we'll if if our speakers agree we can go on for another uh, 10 or 15 minutes or 
because it's all so fascinating and we're learning so much and we're being inspired and edified and uh, we're all getting ready to become activists if we're not ready, if we're not already activists. I just want to thank you so, so much for coming and uh, sharing your experiences and wisdom with us here at Villanova. Well, thank you. I don't mind because I see someone else. Brian has a, a question. I don't mind. I think I, I like talking to people. I don't mind. Oh, wait. <laughs> What's your question, Ryan? Hey, how you doing? First, um, I want to thank you guys. Uh, I, you all, I shouldn't say guys, because <laughs> acknowledging the 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 women in the movement. Um, and I appreciate you you being here and and telling your story. Um, but as um, to, to on a personal level, um, clearly I'm a, I'm a white guy. Um, my son is is biracial, which means you know according to um, in America he's black. Um, I recognize that. I know that, and and um, you know, I know. Unfortunately, my my whiteness doesn't cover him um, and protect him, and that's a, a worry, a big worry. Even um, with with what happened just yesterday, hit me really hard. Um, it, it all does, but you know, um, my my question to you um, is: seeing what happened um, and what you been through and what you've done from the sixties um, until, until now, does it seem like it's getting better? Do you see, um, do you see the, the, the positive changes being in, in, um, done around the country? And are we, are, you know, do you think that it's possible for us to head on the right direction or am I moving to Canada? Like, <laughs> can, can we, you know, is, is, is it, are we on a, a good trajectory and, you know, is, um, is, is it possible? And that, that's what I'm, you know, I, I talk to my in-laws all the time about this and, and, you know, to get, just be poured on with that knowledge of what it was, what it was like. And, you know, it feels it's, it's a, it's a, it's a haul. It's long and, and it's hard and every day it's stressful. And um, I can't even, you know, begin to empathize um, with, with that, aside from being a parent, you know, and, and so I'm, I, I, I'm, I have skin in the game literally. And I, I just want to, I want to keep my kids safe and, you know, I'm hoping, hoping that things are getting better and that we're on a good trajectory and while being careful and safe and, and educating everyone, um, is what we can do and, you know, then pray and, and let them <laughs> get, get out there. So, yeah, I guess my question is, what, what do you think? How, how have we come from, from there to here and where are we going? And more, more uh, is what I'm concerned with. Like, how are we, are we on the right path and what do we need to do to get closer to that right path? Well, I see, I see a lot of good things happening out there now. And I think back, uh, say, five, 10 years ago, uh, and I wondered at that time, you know, where are all the activists, you know, we need a movement. That was my thing. You're going to need a movement to make the kind of changes we want to see. <clears throat> and uh, I'm impressed with uh, the work of the Ron young uh, activists uh, out there today. They are, uh, I can only, you know, imagine what we might have done if we had access to uh, the kind of technology you have today, that, that they have today, and had one of these in my back pocket, you know. Uh, but if we didn't have that. We did the best with what we had, what we uh, had at the time. But um, I see today. I mean, the conscious le consciousness raising is at a global level today. We never got approached that, you know. 
pockets, small pockets around the, the world, but not masses of people in the street like you see today. Uh, next question is, what do you do with all that energy? How do you direct that energy and fo uh, focus it so that the, you bring about the, the kind of world you can imagine? And if you can visualize the world that uh, you want, you can do it. You can create it, you see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with young folks. They do have a vision. Uh, the tactics and the, uh, the strategy, uh, like uh, us, we had to learn to think on our feet because there was no blueprint, no textbook, none of that. You had to make it up as you went along. And I see a lot of that today too, you know? Young people are creative and uh, I'm proud of them, frankly, because uh, we always raise our kids. We want them to be smarter and more creative and quicker than we are, you know, better than us, because that's what progress me is. If they're just like me, then I fail, you see. So these kids today are amazing, you know. Uh, I'm here though to warn them. That this is not going to be a cakewalk, you know. This is not, you know, the the system is designed to protect itself and maintain the status quo. And the reaction is to preserve itself at all costs by any means necessary. So you have to be prepared and understand that there are gonna be consequences. I tell the activists today, today's activists are tomorrow's political prisoners. And uh, be prepared for that. I mean, if you're gonna be in it, then you have to be in it for the, for the long haul. And you have to be in it with a total commitment. You can't play with this, you see. Yeah. I would thank you. And, and Brian, I would just thank you for your question. I think that the more of us recognize as to take your words, we have skin in the game. Like just because something doesn't affect me personally does not mean that I am not impacted by it and that, that I should not be actively engaged in the struggle against it or if the struggle is for something, right? It's like what Martin Luther King said, what doesn't affect you di directly does affect you indirectly, right? And so it's understanding that we are connected by, we, we, if you are working class, you're working class. Of course, there's some specificity to being black and working class. There's just like there's some specificity to being uh, undocumented and working class or white and working class, but there's still some common struggles. And so we can't be in our individual silos and say, oh, well, that's those people over there. So that never happened to me. So I don't care. Right. And so once we start to recognize that the system is designed to keep people oppressed, and that police are killer police who protect property and capitalism and not people and the foundation of the police is what it is then one we educate our children because that's a painful thing to to, to have to tell our children like and it don't mean that they're going to be safe but this is what you do when you encounter a police some people don't have to do that your son is black so you have to have that conversation with them and his mother has to have that conversation with them other people don't have to have that conversation because it doesn't happen to their children, right? But we have to prepare them so that they know, right? Because oh, we always want them to walk away alive and, and safe. But having these conversations with people and saying, yeah, this may not affect me in my neighborhood. You know how people always say, that don't happen in my neighborhood. Yeah, well, it happens to some people every single day. And that is a reason why we should all be connected because they're saying, if they come for you in the morning, they're coming for me at night. It's just a matter of when it's gonna happen. It is gonna happen. So 
there are changes, but we have to know that as someone said, I think Hank said it, freedom is a constant struggle. We don't drink water to, uh, we don't not drink water today because we had water yesterday. We gotta drink water every day. So we gotta fight for freedom every day. We gotta fight for justice every day. It's a constant protracted struggle. And part of what we're living through right now is and have been for the past 50 years, it was JL Gahu, the war that J. Edgar Hoover waged on the Black Panther Party through COINTELPRO. He said those things, right? The four things he wanted to happen was prevent the long to prevent the rise of a black messiah, prevent the long-term coalition of quote militant black youth, prevent black militants from gaining respectability and credibility. Those are things that we are living through today. And so we just don't know that it was COINTELPRO, but these things that we're living through exist because it was deliberately done to squash a movement, to squash activism. So we got to get back to building and educating and growing the activists. And you're right, young people are inheriting this mess. So they, they are the ones that are the most impacted. So they're out there because they know that they're impacted. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here, for spending this afternoon with us, for inviting me to be a part of it. Thank you, Brother Hank, for your wisdom and your presence. Um, and your work on behalf of the um, of, of folks and as member of the Black Panther Party, we appreciate you and salute you. And thank you to you all for being here. Thank you, Dequi, for being who you are. Thank you for coming. And we are leaving inspired and determined to do more and do better and continue to be activists. Thank you, thank you Karen. Thank you. Thanks for thank doing you. this. Yes. Yes, thank you all.